It's in your name I pray. Amen. morning so Jesus getting ready to leave his disciples we have this final prayer that Jesus is uh, praying over his disciples Um, it's a prayer that's not just sweet for them but he turns and actually looks at us he prays for us and what we're going to look like in the world what's the impact that you and I are going to have those who not just his immediate disciples but those who even believe because of what his disciples would go out and share, which is where you and I fall into this passage. So as Jesus is praying over his disciples this message, uh, I think it's important for us, and what this passage, this particular section is going to focus on, is to recognize that it's not just enough for Jesus to have good intentions about what he wanted to accomplish in the world. You know, whether you're a leader in business or some other organization or a group of people, uh, leaders always have to think not just about what they hope for, but what's, what's the outcome that they want to accomplish and how do they actually get the group to that outcome? You know, if uh, a CEO stands up and takes over a Fortune 500 company and says, I really intend for us to be more efficient, more profitable, you know, a better investment for our stockholders, And then, after a year or two or three, and he's done everything that he wanted to change in the company, the company is less efficient, less profitable. It doesn't matter how well he intended for things to play out. What matters is the actual result that he got based off of what he was doing. I think it's important for us to realize that as Jesus was leaving, he wasn't just leaving us with good intentions. Jesus wasn't giving us a message that would say, oh, we really hope for the best, but we never actually experience any of it now. You know, there's some times that I've heard the Christian faith talked about as if it's a call to endure all of the crappiness in this life. Everything goes bad, and then we get to heaven where it's all going to be better. And there's certainly a, a real component to that that when we do finally stand there face to face with Jesus, we will see things in a way that we never could in this earth. We will see things healed and mended in a way that we never will on this earth. But Jesus didn't leave saying, wait until you die or I come back and then you will see all of the glory of the Son of God. But he said that we would start to experience it now. And this passage that we're about to talk through is actually Jesus describing what are those who truly believe going to look like? What are they going to start to uh, experience in this world as a result of believing what I'm teaching them? Verses 6 through 8 is really Jesus just reaffirming the group that he's specifically talking about. He's talking about those who believe me, who received me, as John chapter 1 talks about those who he who believed him, who received him, he gave the right to become children of God. This is the group that Jesus is praying for. These are the true believers who have placed their life, their faith, their convictions, and built them on what Jesus is teaching. The first couple of verses talked about in our passage. These are the ones who received the word of God and have started basing themselves and their lives off of it. So what are they going to look like? It's not enough for Jesus to intend for his disciples to look different. He never actually accomplished it. I think sometimes in our uh, culture, this is the, the temptation that every culture that becomes predominantly Christian faces. There comes a point where after Christianity has become the norm for so long that it's kind of socially beneficial to be a Christian. I know that we see some people on news stations and in other parts of the country where we think, oh, but they would oppose us or whatever. But if I were to walk around town and walk into businesses and walk in and say, I'm a Christian, versus if I walked in and said, I'm an atheist, which one do you think I would actually get the more negative response to? It would be if I walked around and said I was an atheist. 
we still live in a culture that's predominantly favorable towards Christians. I mean, the fact that on any given Sunday morning, a large portion of the population spends their time sitting in a building listening to some person standing up there pretending he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> like, says that we still live in a culture where a lot of people believe in this. Uh, and the temptation that comes with that is that we can kind of develop this idea culturally of what it means to be a Christian and not necessarily align it with what Jesus taught his Christians to look like. So, not just looking at Jesus' intentions, it's not just give them a message of hope so that they know when they die one day they're not going to go to hell. But give them a message that actually produces the effects in them that if they really believe this, if the word of God really comes to bear in their hearts and they start to place their life in its leading and guidance, what are they going to look like? Who are they going to look like? What does Jesus pray for his disciples to be? That's the question we have to ask from this. And so starting and working through this passage, there's a couple of things that Jesus makes clear. One is that Jesus' disciples are going to be provided for. You know, in verse 17, Jesus says to the Father, everything I have is yours, and everything you have is mine, and I am glorified in them. This is very reminiscent of language where, for example, in chapter 16, Jesus says when he's talking about the Spirit, he will glorify me because, so the image of him glorifying Jesus, that we Jesus is glorified in us. We make much of Jesus. How do we do that? Because he will take from what is mine, that, that pool of resources that Jesus shares with the Father, the character, the promises, the hopes, all of these things that are Jesus the Son and Jesus the Father share. What does the Spirit do? He comes to us and he takes from what is Jesus's. And declares it to us. Everything the Father has is mine. This is why I told you that he takes from what is mine and will declare it to you. You know, Jesus leaving us did not leave us ill prepared or unequipped to handle the challenges that you and I face. Sometimes Satan's uh, device against us is to make us forget this. To think that Jesus did a really good job for the maybe the immediate disciples that he was with 2,000 years ago. Maybe there are other ways that, you know, we look around and we think about all the supernatural works that the Bible talks about happening with his disciples. We can hear stories from other parts of the world where it seems God works in supernatural ways. And we think, OK, well, maybe God's just not giving us all the tools of the trade that we need. But Jesus in this passage. When he's talking about who he is as our savior. It is not one of a savior who said, come and follow me. But you really got to go support race. Gather your own resources. Find your own means of accomplishing this. No, to us, what he says is as your savior. All that the father has is mine. And all that I have is his. And when I leave and the spirit comes to you. It becomes yours. It, it, we've read Romans 8 several times over the past few weeks, and it's because it reaffirms over and over, if he did not even withhold his own son for us, how will he not give us everything? You see, we are provided for. And this isn't a provision that you have to fabricate yourself. We were talking about this morning in Sunday school. Um, we're working through our course uh, book and it's talking about money and how you handle money and that when it comes to giving and being generous in giving and that a lot of times there can be this mentality of us having to try to provide for ourselves and we almost see it as if I give this money to the church or if I give this money to this person in need then I'm not going to have enough for what I need or want and Rebecca and I I was always raised when I was growing up. I don't, I'm not, I don't think that in the New Testament there is a strict you have to give 10%. Uh, 
I have always given 10% because I was raised being taught that. So that was just the starting ground from when I was like eight years old and I got like a dollar. You know, I was taught you bring a penny, or not a penny, that's really bad math, okay. <laughs> yeah, bring a dime. What is cash? Who uses that anymore anyway? So, but yeah, and so you bring that, you give it to God, and it's not a matter of uh, God needs that. Like, that's his already. But it's a matter of, are you willing to trust that he's ultimately the one that provides for you? And so we always live by this, and it's been very hard to sometimes. Um, but one time we moved to seminary, and when we moved in, uh, we knew God was leading us to go there. We moved up about a month before we started school. And it was to move into the apartment, and that was the only thing we knew. We knew we had an apartment, and we knew that we were going to school there. Uh, we had some savings, and so we move up there, and trying to figure out the job situation was we're carrying boxes out to go to the dumpster as we're unloading and unpacking in our new apartment, which was 900 square feet. It was so big at the time because we had moved from like a 400-square-foot trailer to 900 square feet. But as we're moving into it, uh, we're carrying the boxes out to the dumpster, and when we're going out, bump into this couple. We're like, hey, where's the dumpster? We don't know where it is. And they're like, well, we're about to move out. Can we have your boxes? And also, can we take you to breakfast tomorrow? Um, so we go to breakfast, and that couple, the wife, wound up being the one who got Rebecca a job working at the private Christian school that she worked at while we were there. There was a several months later, my job situation had not worked out. I tried a couple of different things, and it was just I wasn't able to find something that was uh, working for us. Um, we're trying to pay off school as we're going, and we're just broke. Uh, savings run out. So there was a day that we were about to have to go to the grocery store. We had to choose between with the little bit of money left in our account to pay our power bill or to pay go get groceries. So we paid our power bill, and we're about to put the groceries on a credit card. So that's where we're at, like no extra money at that point. And as we're sitting there feeling the weight of just how little money we have, and you know the fear and the anxiety of am I going to be provided for? And it seems to us that the answer is no. We get a knock on the door. And it was a, a couple who we had become friends with said, we just felt God telling us that we should get a box of groceries and bring it to you. And as we're sitting there and we start looking through it, the things that are in the box are the things that we were going to go get. And so it's during that season where we were broke as could be, where we're struggling to pay everything that we had, that was a commitment that Rebecca and I made. We're like, okay, we're going to put God's promises to the test. Like, we're going to cast ourselves on him. And we're going to say, either you hold me up and this thing floats or it's going to sink, but it's not going to be because we didn't actually put our trust in you. And God proved faithful. Like, I think so many times, if we're honest with ourselves, you and I want a Christian faith where we never actually have to trust God. We want it to be easy. Yes, I believe in God, but I'm working this job where I also make 200000 a year. And I don't really have to worry about any of my needs. Yes, I want to trust God. Uh, but I'm really just going to, you know, this area that something's messed up in, rather than praying, I'm really going to spend time just working as hard as I can trying to fix it, even when it's futile. Yes, I want to trust God, but. And what we rob ourselves of is actually the opportunity, and this is the way that we think back on that moment. When that box of groceries showed up, it was a direct care from our Father taking care of us personally. God was not abstract in that moment. His Spirit was alive and well in the lives of other brothers and sisters who were listening to Him and came to meet our needs at just the right moment. And I just want to challenge us. When Jesus calls us to walk in obedience with Him, when He sends us out on mission to serve in the world around us, he sends us out as those who are provided for by a father who delights in giving his children good things. We don't have to be fearful of 
losing what we need. In fact, Matthew, when Jesus is talking to uh, groups in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, he says this, when you pray, don't babble like the Gentiles since they imagine they'll be heard for their many words. Just before we move on, go back to that one. There are some times that we act like what God needs us to do is to convince him to be a good father to us and provide for us. Like, you have to convince him to love you. When what God's word tells us is that he proved his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He proved his love for you before you ever did anything right to earn it. And so his provision for you, his care for you, as you go out and you face the challenges of this world and being faithful, his provision for you is not contingent upon of how good a job you do in that. Because his love was never based on how good of a job you were doing to begin with. But the next verse says this. Don't be like them. Because your father knows the things that you need before you ask him. Therefore, you should pray like this. Our father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, we are told, seek first the kingdom of God. And all of these needs that you have will be given to you. You know, there are going to be points where you have to make the decision. Do I trust God and seek to build his kingdom? Or do I try to just take all of my resources, my time, my talents, my money, my house, my relationships, and hoard them like there's some scarcity that if I don't hoard them to myself, I'm going to somehow not have what I need. You know, if you watch uh, like the preppers, sometimes we treat our relationship with God like we have to prepare for that moment that God falls apart. But brothers and sisters, we're not called to make sure that we provide for all of our needs. But Jesus also says in Matthew, he takes care of the lilies in the field and the sparrows that fly and not a single one of them falls out of the sky without him knowing it. How much more valuable are you to him? Like, never become convinced as you're trying to walk in faithfulness that if you are taking a risk and seeking to actually live in faith, trusting God to care for you, that he has a limited supply to be able to actually care for you while you're seeking his kingdom. He doesn't. It's just such a confidence for uh, me. I mean, you think about the political environment we're in right now, which I kind of thank goodness it's going to be done in like a couple weeks. I'm really tired of all of the commercials interrupting uh, my good moments watching football and really just Debbie Downer comes on my screen. Like, You know, they all portray it as if this candidate wins, it's over. This is the most important election of your lifetime. Uh, I've had six of those. (laughs) Like, so we're given this, like, here's all of this, the most important election. If this candidate wins or if that candidate wins, it's all over. You know that the kingdom of Jesus never needed America to go forth? Do you realize that no matter who wins on Tuesday, your God still sits on his throne? And your father still cares for you? You know that it doesn't matter what chaos is going on around you. You are still provided for to be able to meet those challenges with faithfulness. And that it doesn't matter whether the government goes one direction or the other. When we gather around the throne... We will not sing the praises of whoever gets into office this week, but we will sing the praises of the King of Kings who has never been up for election and never will be. So this is what we're given as a promise and a hope. 
Our God provides for us. We don't have to be fearful of what comes. Sure, uh, we may have ideas of what our needs are that don't align with God's. And sometimes that's why God actually lets us lack in some areas is because it's not really a need that we think we have. It's a want. It's a desire. And so God lets us go without because he wants us to realize we don't need it to survive and we don't need it to be the most flourishing human being that we can be. That sometimes his answers, his no, are not because uh, he's bad, but it's because us only thinking, if I have this, then I'll have all I need, is what's actually bad. So he lets us go without. But he always provides for us what we need. He never fails in that. The second thing is Jesus, his disciples are in the world. Verse 17, 11 says, I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father, protect them by your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. You see, we're in the world. There have been many Christian movements throughout history that thought the problem of sin is because we're around all of these messed up, lost people. And so let's go away and seclude ourselves in the deserts or in the mountains or in the monastery or in whatever it was and hide away. And what they always found was that the sin went with them. That They get to those places and there's a lot of really good things that came out of some of those movements. But they never escaped being in the world. You see, Jesus didn't give us a gospel that's about us escaping the world. You know, there are different views on public school and homeschooling. I will tell you this, for those of you that are in public school, you are a person that is equipped to be the, the light of Jesus Christ in the world where you are. Yeah. There are always pressures, always environments, always things that we walk into where we are going to be surrounded by people who don't share the conviction to follow Jesus, who don't want to build their life based on faith in him. And you are not called to then say, well, if you're not choosing Jesus, I want nothing to do with you. Why? Did Jesus do that? Because if Jesus was going to do that, he never would have came to earth to begin with. It, it was while we were rejecting him. It, it wasn't while we were considering him, deciding whether or not we really wanted him. To, it was while we were rejecting him and we did not love him and care for him that he came to us. Why? Because if he had never come into the world, you and I would have been without hope. And the reality is that some of you, all of you, have people that Jesus has put in your life that are different than you, that use different language than you, that have a different sense of humor than you do, that have different morals than you do, so that you can be in the world to show them who Jesus is. It's not so that you can remove all of them from your life. Now, if they become the predominant people you're hanging around and they're the main people you're always influenced by, you're going to look a lot more like them. But they, God puts those people in our lives so that we'll have them into our homes and have meals with them. So that we'll go and work with them when their cars are breaking down and they need a helping hand. So that we'll do those types of things so that we can be in the world just as Jesus was in the world. He came to us. He came to us with the understanding of they're really messed up. Like, that's pretty much Jesus' message to us was, I really love you. I created you. I designed you. And you've messed it all up. Yeah, I love you, and I'm still going to come to you. Because I'm not content to leave you where you are. Paul illustrated this when he was a tent maker. So he wasn't a professional pastor that worked at a church. He was a, a tent maker. He traveled around. He took missionary journeys. And you know what he did? It was in the marketplaces where he was selling his tents that he would engage with people and teach them about who Jesus was. But, but it wasn't just the people that happened to come across his way. You know the story of Mars Hill where Paul goes to the thing called the Aragopagus? He goes up. It's this 
place where all of the, the thinkers would debate ideas with one another. You know, oh, this person's claiming this God revealed this to them. Let's think about that. Oh, there's this new philosophy. Let's ponder it and its conclusions. And Paul goes up there. He goes to them. He goes to the place where they are trying to exert their influence. He goes into their house. And because he is certain that his God will care for him and provide all that he needs, he's able to walk into that place as a child of God and declare the resurrection of Christ. The God who has come to us to save us. You know this statue that you have over here that says to an unknown God? Well, let me tell you who that unknown God is because he's the creator of all things. Paul looked for those ways where he had things in common with the people of the world around him. He looked for places that were uh, unifying points that he could build off of. Because what's ultimately true is eternity is written in our hearts. We know that we long for our God and that there's something missing. And it takes us being attentive, paying attention to people, finding points of commonality with them to be able to help them then see this is the God who's answer. This is the God who cares for you and comes to meet you in that specific way. This is the God who's willing to provide for you. You see, we're not called to just segregate ourselves off away from the world. We're called to be in the world. It's why it's so important for us to think about, like, the church is not just when we gather in this room on Sunday. This is just, and quite honestly, uh, my role is not as like, okay, there's this spiritual hierarchy of, like, ministerial jobs over here and secular jobs over here. Like, do you realize that uh, ministers are one of the occupations that are guaranteed not to be in the new heavens and new earth? Like, you're not going to have a pastor in heaven. You're going to have your Savior. You won't need me. Like, you know what's probably going to be in new heavens and new earth? Carpentry. Plumbing. Electrical. You know, those are all things that were already in God's creation when he made Adam and Eve and he told them to go out and to cultivate and to do things. They were gardeners. They were farmers. I'm sure they really would have loved at that point to have like, you know, uh, these automated machines that would go out and plant fields and harvest it for them. They hadn't advanced along enough at that point. But there are things like that that I think we're still, it's not going to be us sitting around plucking strings and just, you know, thinking of new songs, which, by the way, music, that's another occupation. Like, it's going to be us going out and learning about God's creation and how it displays Him and His wonder. You know, exploring our earth, building things that honor Him and His greatness, worshiping Him. It, it will be humanity as if sin never entered the picture and we just progressed in cooperation of how much can we actually glorify our God. And so, as we think about that, uh, when you think about your role, your role in coming to church is not this. For you to come and just be encouraged and have the real ministers minister to you. And then you go throughout your week the rest of the week. You should think of it more kind of like a pit stop. Um, I grew up, my dad loved NASCAR. And, you know, you had pit stops that you had to do during the race or you were not going to win. You had to have those times that you came in and the pit crew ran out, did their thing, got out of the way, and you went back out to win to race. And here's the reality. Each of you are in your race. Like church is a pit stop. But I can't go into your workplace, sit down at your desk, and say, hey, I am Jared Clark. And I'm going to do maintenance on your building today. Because they'd probably be like, you have no idea what you're doing. Please leave. <laughs> but my call is to be here to serve as a brother that is equal with you in terms of being a minister. You are all ministers that God has called to go out into the world to shed the light of Christ where you are. This is not a place for you to come and say, that's my Christianity for the week and tuck it aside. 
This is the place for you to come and say, God, teach me. I play a specific role. I teach God's word. I help to manage the church. I play a specific role here. But you come in, and your role is come in, study God's word, be encouraged by the fellowship, and then go into the environments that you're in on a weekly basis, and you are the minister in those places where people can meet God. You're called to be a minister. Paul made it clear, the role of pastors is to train the saints. That's you. For the work of ministry. The work of ministry, most of it does not happen in this room on Sundays. It's going to happen in your homes and in your workplaces as you engage with people and show them what it's like to be impacted and changed by the gospel of Jesus. And as they start to see that and believe, that's where ministry happens. You see, Jesus was a, a carpenter. Paul sold tents. We have stories of people in the New Testament like Lydia who uh, sold fine purple clothes. You're not called to separate yourself from this world and the work in it. You're called to go out into it as people who bear the light of Christ. The second, third thing is Jesus' disciples were watched over, guarded, protected. He says in verse 12, while I was with them, I was protecting them by your name that you had given me. I guarded them, and not one of them is lost, except the son of destruction, so that scripture may be fulfilled. You know, when you're going out and you're facing things that you never thought you would be able to face, because Jesus seems to like putting us in those situations, and I think it's partially to remind us that we need to be dependent. Like, you can't handle all of the problems that you face on your own. You need Christ. And sometimes in our pride, we think, oh, we can you know, pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps, which I actually learned was a, uh, not a compliment when it first became a phrase. I mean, you think about it, imagine someone standing here trying to grab his own bootstraps and lift himself off the ground. Like, you can't do it. But we think that that's sometimes the way that we have to live in this world. But when you actually are pushed to your brink and you think, I can't do this, that is the place where you can meet God, for him to actually help you do that, to give you the strength to, the encouragement, the giftings, the resources, things that come from outside of you, like a random uh, couple showing up with a box of groceries that you need in just the right time, things you have no ability to take the credit for, but God does. Like He watched over his disciples and protected them and guarded them. And he does the same thing to you and to me as we go out into our lives. As you face those people who are hostile to you or environments that you're just fearful of what the reaction will be if you share your faith or if you even try to just get close to these people, as you're maybe fearful of there's some things about these people that I really don't enjoy and I don't want to become like that, but I still know I'm called to be around them and minister to them. Guess what? Jesus is with you in those moments to help protect you from becoming more like the world and to help your light shine more like him. He watches over you and guards you so that you won't be lost, drawn away. If You rely on him. He asks the father to watch over us. He watches over us as we go in whatever environments we do go out into. We don't go alone. Our God goes with us. Jesus' disciples are also to be joy-filled. Verse 13, he says, Now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy completed in them. We're to be filled with joy as we go. If you truly understand, your God is never going to let you go without what you need. That your God loves you unconditionally and provides for you. That he watches over you. That he protects you. That he, as you go out into the world, he goes with you. That at the end of this life, after you have done everything you can to serve him, that you will close your eyes to this dark world and wake up to a light, uh, a world that is just riddled with the light of our God. 
and you have that hope, we should have joy. Joy is not this fake happiness. It's not like put on a smile so people think you're happy. Uh, Think about rejoicing. It's the ability to say in dark moments where all seems hopeless, but your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, and you anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. It's the ability to not let the circumstances cause you to despair, but instead to say, at the moments where I feel the least in control, I know that I am the most secure because my God is with me. Rejoicing is delighting in who our God is more than the circumstances that we face. Rejoicing is letting our mind be fixed on the one where our help comes from, the maker of heaven and earth. And if he's for you and me, and if he tends to us and cares for us, then what what could cause us to despair in this life? Even when we see the the most difficult parts of the curses of sin in this world, broken relationships, death, wickedness running rampant, we can rejoice in the fact that those are not, it's not like God is uh, somehow failing in those areas. Those are areas where our God is not. You may ask the question, How do we make sense of our God being good and the evil that we see in this world? I think it's a, there's a St. Augustine or St. Augustine. You may have heard him called either of us. He talked about the problem of evil. It's a very old question that's been talked about a long time. They say we talk about it like evil is this real thing out there going around. When what it really is, it's the absence of something. It's the absence of God. Like cold is the absence of heat, and dark is the absence of light. Evil is the absence of God. We can't look at evil and say, well, God, why is that there? And it's because he's not. Because we choose to create areas in our life where we drive him away, and we say, you don't, we don't want you here, God. We don't want you to have anything to do with this area of my life. And then evil comes into it and suffering happens. And then we say, God, why is that happening? When we were rejecting him all the more the beginning of it to begin with. You see, as we go out into this life and we go into these difficult circumstances, if we are not a people that are filled with rejoicing, joy in who our God is, it's kind of like, imagine going to a magician's show And as the magician is up there, he's just mopey the whole time. Ta-da. Pick a card. Yay. Like, he could do the most incredible magic, (laughs) have the best uh, act, and yet his delivery completely sink your desire to ever have anything to do with it. You wouldn't come back. You wouldn't tell your friends. You'd be like, that's the saddest magician I've ever seen. Brothers and sisters, if we, clinging to the gospel of Jesus Christ, are filled with dread, hopelessness, despair, it's not because the message we're clinging to has failed us. It may be because we need to remember who our God is to remind ourselves to cling to his promises to remind ourselves of how he provides for us as we go out into the world so that we know he is with me. And that even in those moments where the darkness seems to crowd in, that it's in those moments when God's people are rejoicing in who their God is, despite their circumstances, that the light of Jesus shines the most. And so we should be disciples who are filled with joy because of who he is. Jesus' disciples were also set apart. Uh, He says in verse 17, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. And that word there, sanctify, it's set apart. It is, you are set apart to a a different standard, a different set of uh, guidelines. 
Uh, and we should be people who our lives are set apart. That, yes, we are in the world and we know people in the world, but that ultimately our lives are being conformed to what God has revealed and called us to. That, yes, we recognize benefits of the, the cultures and the traditions that we were raised in, but we also recognize that we're not called ultimately to culture and tradition. We're called to God's word. And a, I haven't ever heard of a single culture or tradition that got all of God's word right. It's always wrong in some respect. Because it's based on humans. God's word is based on the capital T truth. You know, there are ways in which uh, another thing is with us being called into the world. There's sometimes this mentality of uh, Christians can't agree with non-Christians on anything. Because then, okay, we're, we're somehow compromising this. But it's kind of like, a, you know, you may have, say you're on a, you're watching a, a man, young man, try to find a wife. And he's dating. There may be multiple women who, based on their standards, would choose him for different reasons. This one may like his looks. This one may like his humor. This one may like, you know, his pocketbook or whatever the case may be. Like, you may have all these different reasons that they like him. They have their own standards that they come to the same conclusion they want him. It's the same way when we're going out into the world. Do you know that there are unbelievers who value the same thing that Christ valued at different points in their life? And that that's not a point for us to come in and be like, oh, well, you can't really value that. Let me tell you why I value it more. Maybe that's one of those things as we go out into the world that we're kind of like Paul and say, do you have this statue over here that you worship? Like, oh, you really care about justice? Well, let me tell you about Jesus who cared about justice as well. You really care about integrity? Well, let me tell you about Jesus who also cared about integrity. You really care about helping the poor? Let me tell you about Jesus who cared about helping the poor. As we go out, we are to set our lives where we say we are going to set our lives on the standard that is Christ. We are set apart. We build our lives on his word. But as we go out, God's going to supernaturally provide people who come across our paths that share some of those as well. They have a different standard. They're coming to those conclusions for different reasons. But God did not make a mistake in letting you cross their path. But you can say I really value the same thing that you value. And let me tell you why. Like, I really value justice. I want to make sure that wicked people do not go unpunished for the sake of protecting those who are innocent, who aren't the offenders in the interaction. Why? Because Jesus does as well. You see, Jesus... We are told over and over and over in the Old Testament how God is the one who protects those who are oppressed. That he will not let any wickedness go unpunished. And your sense for vengeance and how you see this world and how justice seems so often to be uh, improper. How it seems like the the most wealthy can afford whatever lawyers they want to to get off scot-free with whatever and the poorest always get punished disproportionately because they can't afford lawyers. The times that justice is skewed and the courts don't get it right. Times that it seems that someone very clearly guilty gets off scots free. Does that bother you? Does that cause you to have this desire for, I wish that there was some true justice in this world, and you may even want revenge and vengeance. Well, here's a God that I can tell you says he will never let wicked go unpunished because he cares about justice as well. In fact, he cared about it so much that the reality is we're all wicked before him. Like, as much as you feel that sense of injustice towards that person, how many people have you wronged as well? And God saw that. And knowing that punishment with him always happens for our sins. He said, I'll step down off of the bench and I will go in your place to take your punishment for you. 
a God of perfect justice found a way to let you and me not be punished perfectly for what we had done wrong. There are points of connection that we can make with people in our lives to point them to the God who they're ultimately longing for. To find those common points, but we have to base our lives on the truth that is Scripture, and that's the final thing. Jesus' disciples are committed to the truth. The truth. Capital T. Now, we live in an environment where everybody claims to have the truth. Like, so much so that when I hear an organization that makes it like a, its motto or whatever, like, you know, I'll give you mo- an example. The seminary I went to changed their motto to trusted for truth. And whenever someone has to tell me I'm telling you the truth, like, <laughs> when people claim I have the truth, and it's just absolute, and there's no humility in it, I typically distrust them. And I think there's some fair reason for that. The people I trust the most in that they are trying to tell me truth are people who have humility to recognize they don't know all things like God, and that sometimes they get it wrong, but I can see their heart is actually committed to trying to find the truth. And how is that showed? They admit they're wrong sometimes. A person who is set in their ways and never changes their opinions is not someone who's trying to find the truth. They're, they're essentially making the cr- claim, I know just as much as God does how true everything I believe is. And I've never met a person who knew everything perfectly. I mean, maybe you have, but I haven't. So Jesus tells the Father, prays for us, sanctify them by your truth. When you go out and you're sharing the gospel with people, there are some things that we can know for certain that are true uh, because God's word states them emphatically. There are other things that are not stated absolutely clearly in God's word. Display humility in those conversations. Like, we don't give up and compromise that Jesus is the son of God. But there are other things uh, that are not clearly stated in the Bible. And if we do not show humility as we have these conversations, we will not be trusted as people who are actually committed to truth. We will be identified as people who are committed to trusting our truth, what we believe to be true. I said finally, but I got one more for you. Jesus' disciples are sent. We talked about this already. You're sent out. It's not just uh, me saying it. Jesus says it. John 17, verse 18 says this. As you have sent me into the world, so Jesus sent into the world so that you and I could be saved, I have also sent them into the world. We are sent people. Every one of us. Without exception, if you're a follower of Jesus, you are sent to where you are going, to your workplace, to your environments, to your school. You are sent. And Jesus didn't make a mistake in sending you there. He sent you there so you would trust him, walk in faithfulness, and find that in those environments, you get to be a minister. You get to be a disciple of Jesus if you put your faith and trust in him. Jesus, thank you for how you do provide and care for us. Help us to trust you in all things, to cling to your promises, to know that you care for us well. And as we go out and try to be faithful and obedient, we will find that those who cast themselves on you do not find that they land on something that is fragile and will fall apart, but they find themselves on the rock of ages, the God who proves himself faithful and true over and over again. Amen.